Example 152. A cosmetic company wants to produce silver nitrate for use in its cosmetics and is interested in knowing the most productive procedure for producing the silver nitrate from dissolved silver. It is believed that stirring of the mixture of silver and nitric acid during the dissolving process has an effect on the yield of silver nitrate crystals produced. To determine the optimal number of revolutions while stirring, the company has set up an experiment involving 15 identical samples randomly assigned to one of three stirring scenarios. The yields for the three st stirrings options are shown below. So we have all the yields here. At the 2% significance level, test the claim that the number of revolutions while stirring has an effect on silver nitrate yield. I'm going to actually change this 2% to 2.5% actually. So let's make that 2.5 when we actually do the problem. The reason why we're going to do that is because our tables, we don't have a table for 2%. So we're not going to be allowed to use 2% here. So let's use 2.5. So I'm going to go ahead and just cross that out. I'm going to make it into 2.5%. So forgive me for that oversight. Okay, so there's the 2.5% level of significance, and let's go ahead and work out the problem now. So the claim is that we have an effect on silver nitrate. So what I want to do here for the claim is simply to say, the claim is that at least one stirring speed, right? So at least one speed differs from the others, right? Differs from the others in terms of silver nitrate production. Okay, so that's basically what the problem is saying, right? One of these three stirring speeds is different from the rest and has an effect on the silver nitrate production as a result. Okay, so let's look at the HO and HA from there. HO would basically say that all the means are the same. So that would mean the mean for 10 revolutions per minute is equal to 20, uh, the mean for 20 revolutions. So 20 revolutions per minute is equal to the mean for 30 revolutions per minute. Then from there, we're going to say that the alternative hypothesis is simply, well, that at least one differs significantly, right? At least one differs significantly from the others. All right, so that's good enough for HO and HA. Now, once we have that, our next step of the process is going to be to come up with the data step. So let me remind you what we're going to do in the data step, the way the work is going to be done, the order in which we'll perform the calculations. We're going to do the correction factor, which will then lead to the sum of square for total, right? When we're done with that, we're going to move on to the sum of square for treatment. And from there, we're going to go to the sum of square for error. And after that, we want to move everything to the ANOVA table and we'll finish up the process there. So we do these things in order because we'll need the correction factor for the sum of square total. When we do the sum of square treatment, we're going to need the correction factor, and then we'll need both of these two, the sum of square total, sum of square treatment for the sum of square error. And then finally, we'll need all those things for our ANOVA table. So we do them in that order to ensure that everything is ready when we need it. All right, let's go ahead and start working on that data step then. That data step is going to be involved, as you remember. To make it easier, I'm going to put some numbers up that I've calculated already for this data. They have given us the totals at the bottom, and that's good. Remember what the correction factor is, that formula the correction factor is simply the sum of all the response variable values, so all these numbers in the table. We're going to square that sum and then divide it by the total number of values in the table, right? Not including the totals, of course, right? So I've worked out the sum of those values already, and when I did that, I came up with 51.4. So we'll be squaring 51.4, and we'll divide it by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so there'll be 15, right? 15 different um, values there. Okay, so let's see what that gives us as we work that out. If we do 51.4 squared and we divide it by 15, we end up getting 176.1306667. So that's our number in a calculator. I'm going to store that in mine. I like to have that 
as a value that I can access very easily later on. Okay, once you have the correction factor, you're going to apply it to SST. Or SS total, pardon me. SS total. So SS total is going to be another formula that's going to have a complicated piece to it that's hard to get. And that's this summation of the yi's squared. That's the square of each of the values in this table. Square every value and then add them all together. That takes a long time, so once again I've done that for us on the side. And then we have to subtract off of that the correction factor and that will give us our sum of squared total. Well, I've already done the squaring of all the y values and added them up for us. And when you do that part, this number becomes 176.88. So we're going to subtract from that the correction factor minus the correction factor and let's see what that ultimately gives us. So we'll have the 176.88 minus our correction factor and when we do that we get a very small decimal number 0 0.749 and then we have a bunch of threes. Three, 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 so on and so forth. So I'll just say three repeating at that point because we're about to run out of paper there. All right, so that is our sum of square for total. All right, from there, we're going to keep that aside and use it later. And what we're going to do next is come up with our SST. Now, our SST, remember, is the sum of square for treatments. Now, they gave us the treatment totals, which is good because if you remember how you do SST, you take each total for each treatment. Right? So in this case, it would be 18.3 for the first one. You square it, and then you divide by the number of values in the column. So in this case, it's 5, right? And then you do it again for the next treatment. You take the total of that column, which is 16.3. You square it, and you divide by the number of values in that column. Of course, not including the total. You get 5. Then you add together the total column for the third treatment, which is 16.8. You square it and you divide by the number of values in the column. You get 5. And then subtract off that correction factor again. All right, if we work all this out in our calculator, let's see what it gives us. So remember, you don't need any parentheses for this. Just use the calculator just as you see the calculation here. 18.3 squared divided by 5 plus 16.3 squared divided by 5 plus 16.8 squared divided by 5 minus our correction factor. Our correction factor I stored in the calculator or you can just type yours in 176.13 so on and so forth, right? And when you're done you get this answer 0 0.433 so on and so forth, right? So just three repeating at that point. So sum of squares for treatment. There it is. Now what we have to do next is something called the sum of square for error, right? SSE. That's very easy. We just take SS total, the total sum of squares, and we subtract off the amount that's attributable to the treatment. So if we do sum of square total minus sum of square for treatment, these two numbers subtracted in other words, and just in the order in which we did them, right, this number minus this number, we will have our answer. So let's actually work that out then. We have 0.7493 repeating minus uh, 0 0.43 repeating. What do we get? Well, we're going to do 0.749333333333333 in my calculator minus the value we just had up there a minute ago and we get 0 0.316 0 0.316 okay so that's your sum of square for error now once you've done that remember we've done our correction factor sum of square total sum of square treatment sum of square error we go to our ANOVA table next so let's take all these numbers and put them into a table that table is called the ANOVA table Okay, so here's the structure of our ANOVA table here, right? Our ANOVA table should have a column for source, a column for degrees of freedom, sum of squares, mean squares, and the F test statistic. All right, so step three, to finish it, we're going to fill in this table. So the source is going to be the treatment, of course, right? But in this case, it's the revolutions. So we could write in revs, or we can write the phrase treatments. It doesn't matter which one you write, right? Either one is the same. So revs or treatments, right? Same thing. Okay, and then from there, after that, we'll have error always in the next box, error, and then we'll have the total, right? Now, the degrees of freedom for the rev, the revolutions, is basically the number of revolution treatments, right? Minus one. So there's one, two, three, minus one makes two. The total degrees of freedom is the number of 
experimental unit results, or in other words, the number of values we have, minus 1. So we have three columns of 5, that's 15, minus 1 is 14, that's for the total degrees of freedom. These two must add up to this one, so this must be 12, and remember how you get this one if you want to do it directly. You say the number of total values in the table, which is 15, minus the number of treatments, and that will give you the 12. All right, from there we have sum of squares for treatments. The first column is treatments, remember. Well, I have that number. Sum of squares for treatments we can see was point, point 0.433. So I'm going to write here 0.433 repeating, right? And then for error, we work that one out. The error value was 0 0.316, 0 0.316. So 0 0.316. And then the total degrees of freedom, well, that number is up here that was 0 0.7493 repeating. Great, so we have all that filled in. Now we have to do the mean squares. And don't forget, we don't care about this box here. We'll leave that one out. So we're going to go ahead and get the mean squared values. And the way to do that, remember, is to simply, uh, we're going to divide straight across. So this degrees of freedom into the sum of squares, this degrees of freedom into the sum of squares. And that will produce the mean squares for treatment and the mean squares for error. Let's go ahead and do that quickly. So in the case of the first one, we will have 0.433333 divided by 2, and we get the answer uh, 0 0.216 repeating. So I'll just leave that. Actually, it looks like at the very end they were calling it a 5. I think that might just be, um, you know, because we didn't put in the full decimal place. It should be 0.216 repeating. And then we'll continue on with the next one. The next one is going to be 0.316 divided by 12, and if we do that, we get the answer 0.0263 repeating. Okay, good. So we have our mean square for treatments, our mean square for error. Let's go ahead and divide these two then to complete our step four, which is our test stat. So now we're on to our test stat, and we're going to do that by dividing this number into this number, which will produce this number, right? So that's how we're going to do it. This number goes into that number to produce this number in the table. Okay, so what is our test stat then? Well, our test stat will work out to be 0.216 repeating. So 0.216 repeating divided by the value we just had there, which is 0 0.0263 repeating. And we get the answer 8.228. 8 8.228. Okay, so a pretty reasonable size test stat, a pretty large test stat, but we won't know if it's large enough to reject the null hypothesis unless we compare it against our critical value. So that's our next step. Our next step being the critical value, we're going to go ahead and draw a bell curve. Not a bell curve, an F curve, I should say. So kind of a skewed bell curve, really. So it looks like bell shape ish and then it has a really long skewed tail, typically. Of course, the exact shape depends on the degrees of freedom of the curve, but we'll just kind of say it looks basically like that. And then from there we have to get the alpha from the problem. We'll put the alpha all into one tail on these procedures. It's going to be 2.5% alpha, so 2.5 we'll use, 2.5%. And then from there we have 0 here and we're looking for the critical value that goes here. Now in order to figure out that critical value we're going to need to know its properties, right? So this is going to be an F critical value. The numerator degrees of freedom, in other words the top number that we divided into had degrees of freedom 2. The bottom number that we divided by, that had degrees of freedom 12. That's our numerator and denominator degrees of freedom, and then of course our alpha is 0 0.025. Let's go to our table looking up those values, 2, 12, and 0 0.025 to see what our critical value is. Okay, so we're looking up 2 numerator degrees of freedom with 12 denominator degrees of freedom on the 0 0.025 table. And as we do that, we see that the number that we find is 5.10, 5.10. So that's in the 2, 12 position, and it's 5.10, and that's the number we need for our critical value. Okay, so we found the value 5.10, 5.10. And now we're going to compare our critical value to that, and it looks like it is larger than this uh, test, or sorry, our test set is larger than our critical value, so we're going to go ahead and say that this guy falls on the curve in the rejection region, and therefore we should reject HO and support HA. Alright, now with that 
initial conclusion, we're going to finally give our final conclusion, which is to look at the claim and say, is it closer to HO or HA? And it looks like it's basically the same as HA, so we will say we support the claim. So the sample data support the claim, and essentially it means what? It means that the revolution speeds produce a different level of uh, uh, silver nitrate yield, so that's the final conclusion, basically. The uh, sample data support the claim. The sample data support the claim. And the claim here is that, that not all of the revolution speeds are the same. Are the same. All right, and that's it. I, you know, we can word this a little bit differently, but basically the idea is to say that you know they don't all produce the same amount of silver nitrate yield, and so that means that we could should be able to find one that's better than the rest. And if we look at the data, we can actually see that when you look at the the results from the table, that it should be clear that the 10 revolutions per minute should be superior to the 20 revolutions per minute. And we can say that, I think, because if you can't say the largest and the smallest are different, then you shouldn't be able to say that any of the other combinations are different. So if we can say that there is some difference, in other words, if at least one differs from the other significantly, we must be able to say that the 10 is different from the 20.